glad to have you with us this evening. And perhaps some are on their way, and some who are viewing us right now live or sometime later, we welcome all of you in the name of the Lord. Let's turn now to the book of Ephesians. We're almost through with this great epistle. Ephesians chapter 6, let's read from verse 13, if we could. Ephesians 6, verses 13 to 17. The words of the passage is in front of me in larger font. So I will not be saying 13 instead of 30. But here we go. Let's give it a try. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all to stand firm. Stand therefore having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness, and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace, in all circumstances, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one, and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Amen. Tonight, we'll be focusing on the helmet of salvation, our fifth armor, the helmet of salvation. In this great epistle, Paul has been laying to us first three chapters who we are in Christ, our position, and the summary passage is Ephesians 3.20, now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think according to the power at work within us. In other words, we have power beyond our ability to understand. He has given us ability beyond, above what we can think or imagine. So the first three chapters, he's saying, this is who you are in Christ. Therefore, you have all these things at your disposal. That's what Paul is saying. And then so beginning with chapter 4, verse 1, it says the power is there. Therefore, a prisoner for the Lord urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you have been called. Because you have all this power within you, now I urge you to walk worthily. That's what he says. And then if we were to ask the question, how do we apply that power? That answer comes in chapter 5, verse 18. And do not get drunk with wine, for that is debauchery, but be filled with the Spirit. So we know that we have all this power, and we are to walk worthily by the filling of the Holy Spirit. So in chapter 6, we are talking about the armor of God, and therefore we have nothing to fear, because we have the power. Therefore the command, equip yourself, arm yourself, put on, these are commands. We are given the command because we have nothing to worry about. And you can go into the war with a sense of accomplishment and victory at hand, knowing that God has already won the victory. So we have that sense of victory, and yet it doesn't mean that the battle is going to be easy. We all know that. And the struggles are relentless. We may relax, but Satan never does. And that's the problem that we have. And as we mature, we begin to win a little more than we will lose. But as we are starting out as baby Christians, we will lose almost every time. And then every once in a while, we will win a small battle. But as we mature as Christians, hopefully we will win more than we would lose. The battle lines are drawn. The trenches are dug. And I would like for our commander, when he comes, to write about us that we did not always defect that we did not always repeatedly disobey him, but we hit the enemy as much as we could, the best way we could, inflicting heavy damage. And that's what we would like to be known by, that I do not want our Lord, the commander-in-chief, to come and say of us that we always have just left the battle when things got tough that we always disobeyed him, but that we were true. And even though we fail and, and lost some of those, we certainly have created some damage in the spiritual heavenly realm against Satan. We've talked about in this chapter, 
Verse 14, putting on the belt of truth, which is not necessarily talking about the content of truth. That is going to come later. But we are talking about being ready. We're talking about commitment. We're talking about the attitude here, the belt of truth. And then also in verse 14, the breastplate of righteousness. We said that this was our own purity, our holiness. This is practical holiness because Christ has already imputed to us the righteousness. We are already righteous. But when we are talking about righteousness, we're talking about our purity, our holiness, practical righteousness. Thirdly, in verse 15, shoes of the gospel peace. This is the good news that we have peace with God. Shoes allow us to stand firm against Satan. Playing a little bit of football in my lifetime, I know how important cleats are. You have to stand firm on the ground, otherwise you're going to be sliding all over the place. You are not going to be effective at all playing baseball the same way. God is on our side. That's what this means. Gospel of peace. We have peace with God and therefore we are on God's side. So we have confidence. That's what that verse 15 shoes of the gospel of peace means. And fourthly, shield of faith, which we talked about last time. Whenever you sin, you believe the devil. You believe the devil more than you believe in God. So you're saying for this one, I am going to Believe the devil because he says it's okay for me to sin because after all, you are a gracious God. You are going to give me another chance. I know my salvation is intact and therefore I'm just going to do a little bit of this. I'm sorry, but God stand aside. I'm going to take the side of Satan for this one. So that's what sin is. Ultimately, that's what you and I are doing whenever we sin. So now today, the fifth piece of armor in verse 17 and take the helmet of salvation. Helmet of salvation. A Roman soldier wouldn't dare go to battle without his helmet. That would be foolish. Likewise, a Christian would be utterly foolish to go into battle against Satan without putting on our helmet. And they were made of leather and metal to protect the head from arrows flying around. And Satan has a broad sword that is... Those soldiers had brought swords as well, and so the Satan will come to that in a moment. But they were three to four feet long, held with both hands like a baseball. These were huge swords, and that was to chop off the head, at least crack it wide open, and it was to create split personality, literally. It was to crack open your skull. And they would ride on a horse, and flating away at some footmen down below, they would just have their swords and the people are on the ground, they would smack their heads. And if you were not wearing your helmet, you were doomed. And so they needed the helmet to deflect the blow. And history has discovered that there were lots of skulls with cleavages on the skull and that was caused by these Roman soldiers with these heavy, heavy broad swords. We're not talking about salvation here because again brothers and sisters we already are saved that already happened you and i already are saved you cannot fight satan unless you are already on the side of god because if you are not a believer there is no reason for satan to attack you if you are not a believer he would leave you alone so sometimes when people say well, i never get attacked well, you have to ask yourself this serious question. Am I not attacked by Satan? Because number one, either am I not a Christian? Or secondly, if I am a Christian, I must not be a very good one. Because every child of God will be attacked. I want to talk a little bit about our eternal security of the believer. Because some people are really doubting and questioning, am I saved once and for all? Or could I lose my salvation? Let me put it this way. There are three aspects of salvation. Very simple. Past, present, and future. So when we're talking about the past, past frees us from the penalty of sin. Repeating, frees us from the penalty of sin as we confess Jesus as our Lord and Savior and invited him to our hearts. We are freed from the penalty of sin. That's what we are saved from, the past. 
Romans 6 tells us that you died once. You do not need to die again because you have been crucified with him. You do not need to die again. In Romans 8, 1, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. You are already saved. You are saved from your sins in the past. You have been free from your penalty of sin, the present. Present, you have freedom from the power of sin. You are free from the power of sin. You no longer are dominated by sin. You can't even get one sin laid against your account. The devil cannot even say such and such a person has this sin against that person because the book of Romans tells us clearly nothing can separate us. And this passage right here, there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Nobody can condemn us. Present, Romans 5.10 tells us, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. If we were saved when Jesus died for us, how much more are we reconciled now that he's alive? It's so logical that if Jesus' death saves us, how much more with his resurrected life? Romans 8.34 asks us the question, who is to condemn? And that rhetorical question is, no one. No one can condemn us because we're justified. And salvation also has this aspect of the future. We are saved from the presence of sin. Going back, past, we are free from the penalty of sin. Present, we are free from the power of sin. The future, we are saved from the presence of sin because one day, there will come a time when there will not be any sin. Because when we get to heaven, there will not be death. We all agree with that. We will not die when we get to heaven. There will be no more crying, no sorrow, no death. The wages of sin is death, the Bible says. The result of our sin is death. So if in heaven we do not die, think about it. That means that we, there is no sin, we will not be sinning. We will not die because there is no sin. The reason that we die is that the result of sin, the wages of sin, is death. So we will not be dying. We will have, be freed from the presence of sin. 1 John 3, 2, Beloved, we are God's children now, and what we will be has not yet appeared, but we know that when he appears, we shall be like him because we shall see him as he is. That's the future. We will be like him. We will see him as he is. Right now, we only see him as in a mirror, blur, but we will see him face to face. That's what we are waiting for. So salvation has happened, is happening, and will happen. It's three aspects. So you're talking about the salvation. Am I saved once and for all? Need to understand, first of all, that salvation is in three aspects, three parts, and it's important. Has means justification, that you're justified. Is means you're sanctified, sanctification, and will is glorification, what will happen. When you're glorified, sin will no longer exist. And so right now, we are being sanctified, but before the past, we already have been made justified. We are justified. No one can condemn us. Amen. It's a very important aspect of our belief that we have been justified. Romans 8.30 and those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorifies. The, the last three there, it says, whom he called, he also justified. And he also glorified. And I guess it doesn't have the other one. Okay. But we are justified, sanctified, and glorified. If in the past... Everything is done. If in the present, we cannot lose it. And in the future, it is secure because it's in the future we will be glorified and everything is all done. That is why in Romans 8.22, we read this. For we know 
that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. Even the creation knows something is out of whack. Even the universe, the creation, it knows that something is wrong. It's waiting for that liberation, that time when things will be put back to normal. And so when Christ returns, he will recreate the heavens and the earth. He is going to actually decreate what he has created. He will be scrolling back and then he will create new heaven and new earth. Paul is talking about how sin affected creation and cursed it here. He's saying how because of our sin, we have contaminated the universe, the creation. It is going to get better. In fact, it is going to be perfect, but only when Jesus returns. Here, it is not going to get better. And so what is happening in Russia and Ukraine and even the civilians are being attacked now. And even if the Russians were to take over that country, experts say that they will not because they will not going to give in. And they are not going to, on the ground, put down that flag symbolizing victory. But even if they were to, the entire world is watching. And they are not going to give respect to the nation that just simply overpowered another nation by killing civilians. We have wars and rumors of wars and earthquakes and famine and all kinds of evil in this world. Things are not going to get better until Christ returns, the Prince of Peace. And yet we're always looking to make our lives better and to be happy and joyful, which is all good. But we need to realize that spiritually things must get worse. And it is not a surprise that Satan is attacking every facet of our lives. And that is just a reality. We're living in a world that Satan controls. The whole creation knows something is desperately wrong. And this isn't the way God made life to be. We are waiting, the nature, the universe is waiting for its redemption. We all are waiting for our redemption. So what is the helmet of salvation? It is confidence in a full, final, total salvation to come that someday this battle will be over. Can you imagine running a race and there is no finish line? There is a finish line. There is an end to this. And Christ says, do not lose hope because it will soon happen. It will come to an end. So we are running. Do not be discouraged. We are running the race. So this helmet of salvation is confidence in a full and final total salvation to come. Satan's big broad sword, as I said, are twofold discouragement and doubt he throws at us with his broad sword discouragement and doubt and i would like for us to consider first kings chapter 19 the story of elijah and this elijah is kind of like peter of the old testament because he has such up and down in his life he just had a great victory he has, with his sword, slaughtered 450 priests of Baal. He was flying high. God sent fire down from heaven, burned up the altar. But Jezebel sent a messenger saying that he, she was going to kill Elijah or she will die trying. If he can handle 450 priests of Baal, don't you think that he can handle one woman? History tells us that that kind of logic doesn't hold. We know that many, many men have been wronged by just one woman. And we have examples in the Bible as well. He was pushing 80. He could do only one thing, and that was to run for his life. He runs a day into the wilderness, drops off his, one of his servants, and then he runs one more day into the wilderness. And the Bible says that he sat under a juniper tree and he slept. And an angel of the Lord wakes him up and says, hey, wake up. You have to eat and drink. So the angel makes him drink. But then after he eats and drinks, he goes back to sleep. And the angel for the second time wakes him up. You have to eat and drink. So he gets up and he drinks. And guess what happens? He goes on for 40 days and nights 
he goes to Horeb, mountain of God. And there God says, what are you doing here, servant of mine? He says, I am all alone. My life, they're threatening. They're going to kill me. I'm all alone. And God says, you are not alone. There are 7,000 men in Israel who have not once bowed down to Baal. And they have not kissed him. He was totally shocked because he was saying, kill me, take my life away. I want to die. He was very discouraged. I want you to know that in spiritual, your service to God and your ministry, you may have some victories. The thing is, when you are, are on a spiritual high at a retreat or something, more often than not, that is when you're going to be discouraged because Satan does not want you to maintain that spiritual victory. So he will throw at you, number one, discouragement. Elijah had this victory like none other. And yet he was faith, faced with discouragement and the angel of God helped him to recover. And sometimes when you are discouraged and tired, it is simple. The solution is simple as just resting, eating and drinking and going your way. Because when we are physically worn out, we are going to be spiritually weak to fight the battles against Satan. There's another prophet named Jeremiah who was told to preach, but that no one would listen to him. Prophet's career was to proclaim God's word. He was told to go and preach, but no one would listen. That's, wouldn't you say that's some discouragement? First was discouragement. Second is doubt. Perhaps ultimate discouragement is doubt. Satan makes us doubt our salvation. Many of you doubt your salvation. That's what Satan does. And so in order to combat this, you need to wear and put on the helmet of salvation because he's going to come and whack you across your head, making you discouraged and doubt. John 6, 37 says, All that the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never cast out. Once you have received salvation, he will never cast you out. And John 10, 27 my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. And they follow me. Is that all we have? I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. I want you to notice a few things here as I close. First, he says, my sheep. That means that we belong to him. We will not be lost because we belong to him. Secondly, he says, those who know me, they hear me and they follow me. We follow Jesus. And he says, for how long? Eternally. Eternally. And that this is a gift. You cannot earn it. The salvation is a gift. Therefore, we cannot lose it. We never earned it in the first place. It will never perish. Listen, if any child of God has ever perished... Christianity is a hoax. Salvation is not to be believed because it is not forever. It is temporary. But he says, never perish. No one will snatch, Jesus says, out of my hand. And finally, he says, no one will snatch them from my Father's hand. So we have Jesus' hand and Father's hand, double protection. Your salvation is secured in Christ. You will not lose your salvation so long as you have given your life over to Christ. He is the one who holds on to you. He is the one who's sustaining you. He is the one who's protecting you, guiding you all the way to eternity. So, the helmet of salvation is a protection against Satan's blow to your head of discouragement and doubt. Very, very simple. It is not about salvation because you already have it. Even though Paul says the helmet of salvation, salvation has three aspects. The past, the present, and the future. So tonight, as we have heard the message, realize that our salvation is secured in Christ. But we need to continue fighting so that we will be strong and not be discouraged and not doubt. We have been saved by Jesus' blood. Do not let Satan come to you at night or sometimes when you're alone. Idleness is a very dangerous thing because Satan comes and attacks you and saying, hey, what are you doing? And makes you discouraged. Oh, yeah, right. I am not good enough to receive salvation. What do you mean salvation by grace? I am just not good. My mouth is filthy. I act badly. I am rude. I make mistakes. I am not worthy to be saved. And we rather believe in the lie that Satan throws at us. And that's what he does. 
Because he knows that he cannot take away our salvation, as I said before many times, he tries to do the very next thing, procrastinate, putting things off until next, and also coupled with that, doubt and discouragement. And so we're like totally, totally ineffective in the kingdom of God. So we may be here worshiping God and, and we're learning about being equipped, but if we only listen and not put these things into practice, what will happen is that Satan will attack you and will make your service to God very, very ineffective. And once again, just reminding us that if he does not attack you, then perhaps you are not really striving to live holy, that you are not really striving to serve God, to glorify him. And it's a big challenge to all of us. As we close our eyes right now, and as we think about the message, I want us to pray for the people in Ukraine. And I want us to pray for the peace so that the civilians will not be harmed and killed anymore. I want you to pray for that area of the world right now. With our eyes closed and heads bowed, could we just say a prayer? Let's lift up our prayers to God at this time together.